Uh, we're on. I like. I don't know. I don't, I like spraying this stuff away from me. I like to spray it right on Chad. All right. So, do you know how many grams or ounces or whatever these things hold? About six, five. Fifteen ounces. Fifteen ounces. Yeah. This should be good. Six hundred. I love it. I love it. That's what mine are too. Seven hundred for good measure. Yeah. I don't think we need to waste more resin because this is not going anywhere. Part A. Oh, this is slow. We're gonna be fine with five fifty. Okay, so that's got resin in it. Zero your scale out. I'm, I'm kind of assuming that, how many people have done resin casting before? Ooh, wow. Okay, so you guys kind of know the, the deal. There'll be time for like questions and different stuff, you know, once we kind of get through this. We'll probably break in between the moisture thing and then the adhesion thing. And if anybody has some questions pop up, you can ask. You can ask anytime, but you know, sometimes I get a little flustered and forget how many grams I just poured. People are asking lots of questions. Okay, so is there paper towels or anything? I get a little crazy when I'm not in my own shop. Everything's all kind of where I know it is, you know? In my shop. Oh, this is not going to work. Got to get 32 ounce cups, Chad. Okay, so three. How much? 600? Okay, so one. 200. 200. I'm going to put 200 apart A in this one. What I'm going to do, because we don't have the biggest, bigger, big enough cups. I'm going to kind of split that and put 200 grams of part A, 200 of part B, and then 100 and 100. Is that right? Someone do the math. I don't do math on the fly. Does that check out? Okay. I don't know. 99. Okay, close enough. So what I'm using today is Illumilite Clear. Um, this one is just the regular, so clear, stop. There's also Clear Slow. Um, again, this is a urethane resin. I'm picking the clear, the one that's not slow, so that it'll, we can take it out of the pressure pot quicker. Um, I, you can demold this stuff or, or you know, pull it out of the pressure pot in like probably 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, and it should be hardened up and you should be fine. The slow, I usually recommend leaving it in for about two hours, but even with that, you can pull it a little bit quicker and everything should be okay. But what I recommend is 30 on the slow and two hours on the, the slow, uh, I'm sorry, 30 on the, the, the clear, and two hours on the, the clear slow. Okay. 100. 100. So we'll be able to pull this out, I mean, probably before, the, before I'm done. Definitely by the end. And part B. <clears throat> and I'm just going to go with clear. I'm not putting any micas or anything because the whole point is we want to see what's going on with this. Although, glitter. Who likes glitter? Anybody? No, not as many glitter. Yeah, yeah I knew it. We're going to do some glitter. I'm pretty sure the chat likes glitter. They love the glitter. Who's in the chat, Chad? Gretchen is here. We had to restart it, so we're, well, we're now getting people joining. Man, you're ruining my numbers. <laughs> Tell your friends. Come join the fun. Okay, that's close enough. 100. So again, I put 100 in, even amount. It's one to one ratio, by the way. by weight? That is a very good question. Um, make sure, and even, even the veterans out there, if you've been you know, casting for a while, make sure that you just, you know, if you're buying the same resin, fine, but if, you, if you're buying a new one that you haven't really used before, it doesn't look familiar, read the label. Just, just make sure to read the label, because if you don't, 
if, if you measure it by volume, like in, in a cup, equal parts just by volume, and it was meant to be measured, you're probably gonna run into problems. It's not gonna cure right, and you're gonna have a bad day. And it's gonna cost you a lot of money. So take you know, two seconds, read the label, and just make sure it's, you know, what is it? By weight, get a scale. By volume, get a cup. And when you're doing it by, with the cup, one, one little tip is make sure, don't stand there on an angle and be like, well, it's pretty close to, you know, whatever the line. Get down on, I can't, it's really tight here, but get down and, and look at it from the same angle so that you're getting equal amounts. Um, you always want to be as accurate as possible. Um, that way, if you do run into a problem, you can diagnose it or at least throw out the idea of, I didn't measure this right, you know. So let's get this mixed up. I put the full 600 in one of these cups during my one-on-one, -on -one and that was not a good idea. <laughs> it was rough. Um, <clears throat> while we're doing this, uh, you know, stir sticks and, and cups, I recommend using the paint mixing cups probably. You can reuse them. Um, these are actually absolutely horrible because you can't reuse them. <laughs> And they're also squishy. Yeah. <laughs> this one, I've got some girth to it right there. That's good. I love these. That's why they're that's why they're out of stock. If you move that half gallon container, we can see. Oh yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you know the, the paint mixing cups are great. You can reuse them, and they're totally smooth. That's a, another thing. I do use um, you know cups like like the Dixie cup things, but You've got, um, you've got like ridges and stuff in them and, and, and whatever you poured in the cup first, that's gonna be trapped in those little ridges and it could throw off your, your mixture. Um, or you could have just little blobs of unmixed resin that get into your resin, which when you know, you're turning it maybe, you get a little blob of something and that's not good. So um, always use, is, you know, try, to, try to scrape the, the cup and get all the part A's and part B's, as I usually say together, mixed up, and you'll get the best results. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, those are good. Nice, yeah. That's a good idea. They are? Did she say jokes or just at me? Are you just being nice? Because she's... Because she can be pretty ruthless. <laughs> Just kidding. So who's who's all in the chat? I, I'm sorry. I think uh, you... we got Gretchen. Uh, who knows who she? Let me know who that is. I don't know. Homer Lex. Oh yeah. Uh, not everybody can comment in there. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna put this on the scale. Um, so I'm, we're just dumping it in. I think I stirred it up pretty good. Good enough. Jessica um, also says she loves these guys. Oh, that's nice. So first, we'll do some broccoli. And I really recommend, you know, take some time, especially when you're doing vegetables like this that you know are just going to turn into failure, and really put them in the right spot. <laughs> you know, you don't want to make this look like crap. You want to, you know, make it art. This is art. Look at that. I think that might be a Chinese symbol. Did you some wash them before you put them in? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, they're trimmed and cleaned. Uh, I was saying earlier, I thought it was kind of funny. They, they put the pizzas all out and opened those up. And then, and then after the pizza was kind of gone, then, they, then vegetables showed up. And I'm like, nobody's eating this. I was like, we got to just dunk it. They're full. Oh, I forgot to put, so I brought some glitter. And so some of these things I do sell, and I brought some, some good deals. But we can do this after the fact. We're going to put a little glitter in there. This is my micro, oh yeah, well, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do both. A Little bit goes a long way with this, but you know, if we're gonna do something crazy, add glitter. Is Ann McDonnelly here? Uh, what about Connie Connie? They love the glitters. Maybe they'll comment now. There's a few watching who have comments of this, I don't know. Oh. They're just waiting to see what the failure, they're like, I know what's gonna happen. They're the regulars. 
Okay. And then I wish I could kind of show you guys what's going on in here, but basically it just looks like resin with a lot of vegetables. Just to let you know. Okay, so we got it all poured. Um, this resin has about a five to seven minute working time, so. Uh, yeah, I just set it in, probably. New pot. I'm good. And we're pressurizing this to get rid of air bubbles. Um, when, I, when you mix up the resin, you introduce air bubbles into it. And if we just let this sit, because it's going to set up so quick, on, it's going to turn hard on us so quick in about five to seven minutes, the air bubbles wouldn't get out, basically. So pressure is going to collapse them down to the point where they're microscopic. And then once it turns solid, um, as far as I understand, it's in solution, which means it's effectively just gone um, once it hardens. All right, so we'll do that. There we go. Where's the thing? You got it set? Nice, close enough. So, and I've gone up to uh, about 60 PSI in this or 50 something. Um, you want to be above 40 is what I recommend for sure. I recommend 50 just in case a little bit kind of drops. Um, but don't go over whatever the max is on your pot and everything will go smoothly. All right, so we just cast vegetables that have a ton of moisture in them. They're wet, okay? Like we could have just dumped top tap water in that resin. What should happen is what happened on the broccoli blank where what you're going to get is this, this white foaming, all right? And this is a, a really horrible case of it, but this illustrates what can happen even with, you know, wood. Um, and even, you know, we're in, in, in the desert right now, so there's not much humidity in the air, but even surface moisture, if you just stuck, stuck wood in that was totally dry, but had some surface moisture, you could get that white film. All right, so what do we do about this? How do you, how do you combat this? Now, <laughs> in the case of vegetables, I guess you could dry them out. I think they're gonna shrivel up and not look like anything very exciting. So I'm not sure that this is a great example of actually something that you would wanna do, I don't know. However, when it comes to you know, wood or choya or um, I gotta be honest, colored pencils. There's some blanks sitting back here. Colored pencils, it's wood, right? Um, anything, I mean, in, in humid climates, even your stir sticks can have moisture in them and, and cause some issues. So, if you're in a if you're in the south if you're in michigan and it's super you know humid it's probably not gonna, well i guess monsoon i mean you could run into issues even with that while you're stirring um, so what do we do uh, there's three things that you can do to get rid of it number one you can dry the material out and, it, and like i said any material it's not just wood it's not just vegetables <laughs> anything that you want to do dry it out in an oven and there's different ways to do that you put it in the oven let it you know and, and what you would want to do is go to about 220 Fahrenheit. I always have to say Fahrenheit because we got a lot of UK people on the live streams. Um, 220, you want to be above the boiling point of water. And so that will help extract all that. Now, in some cases, if you, you know, cook these at 220 carrots, it's, that may not work as well. But with wood and things like that, 220, that'll get it out. Pine cones is another good one. That, that, uh, I do that a lot. Put it in the oven and let them bake. Now, if you're dealing with like a block of wood, uh, you, there's a way to kind of figure out when it's at the 0%. And you're going for 0% moisture content. A lot of people come from the woodworking world and they think that dry wood means 12% moisture content. That's not what it is. It's zero is what we're going for with resin. So you can, the way that you can do it with a, uh, an oven is you put it in the oven for maybe like, depending on the thickness and all that and where, where, how wet it started, Let's just say you put it in the oven, left it there for a day. You weigh it before you put it in, you weigh it the next day, and then you put it back in and just make sure once it stops dropping weight, it's zero effectively, all right? So that's the best way to do it with like larger things. With something like, like kind of like smaller pine cones, I mean, you're probably good with like a half an hour to an hour. If you didn't just walk outside and it was raining and you picked it up. If it had been kind of sitting in a bucket in the shop and it's pretty much as you know dry um, relative humidity, uh, in a half an hour, an hour, or something like that. The longer, the better, if you can leave it in there, just to be sure. Dry, the, dry it out, and then you can stick it in your resin. The other thing you can do 
is stabilize it, which is gonna be better. You're gonna suck out all the moisture and all the air and replace that with uh, a resin that you harden. At that point, moisture can't even get back into the structure of the material. All right, so that's the second thing, and you, if everybody was here for uh, Curtis's uh, stabilizing demo, you learned a lot about stabilizing and it's very effective, but you don't ha have to do that. You can just dry it out, you can stabilize it. The third thing is you can take, you know, like I said, your wood. This is probably not gonna work for something like a pine cone, but if you had just kind of a block of wood, do we have anything like that up here that I can show? I don't know, let's just say that you wanted to, you wanted to drop this in and it was just pretty, you know, dry to, to, to like equilibrium moisture content. Uh, but you didn't want to dry it or you, you were in a hurry, let's say. You don't have time to stick this in the oven for hours. What you can do is just seal it off. Um, you can use something like five minute epoxy and just put a coating on it, maybe two, just to make sure. All you're trying to do is put a barrier between the resin, the casting resin that you're going to be pouring around it and the moisture that's in it. All right, so those are the three ways that you handle moisture. Um, I, 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 don't, I can't think of any other good ways to deal with it or, or ways that you would deal with it or, or issues that would cause you to have to do something else. Um, in some cases, something may be so wet that you just can't use it, I guess. But if you do one of those three things, you should be pretty good. Yeah. Have you tried the uh, moisture content of wood with microwaves? I haven't. Um, that is a way to dry it out, but that's also a way to screw up your microwave and I don't know, it depends, and I definitely wouldn't recommend, don't do that with your home microwave. That, it's gotta be a thrift shop microwave that you bought, you know. People do that with bowls, uh, I know, and, and, and there's, there's ways, I just, I don't know about that, and, and I've also heard horror stories and also good. So, it's tough though, because you also, you could do the weight thing, I think, doing, doing it that way, but you'd have to be real careful, and I think it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. No, moisture meters don't go below 5%, so they're, they're not useful for what we're doing. Um, so, moisture is one. Now, the other one, so does, it, does anybody have any other questions or, or thoughts or comments or, no, nothing? Okay, so the second biggest pitfall is gonna be just, uh, 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 I can't, I just lost the word, smooth, <laughs> smooth, <laughs> smooth surfaces. Um, and, and like I said, there's, there's a lot of things, you know, one of the things, and I brought these up to kind of show, one of the things that I sell is aluminum honeycomb. And again, the, the sides of these, uh, the edges of this where I cut it is a little bit rough. However, the insides are totally smooth. So metals, not the best thing to be putting in resin, and even though I do sell it. However, there are ways to deal with that. Um, number one, with this product, there's just nothing you can do. You just hope <laughs> that it's gonna stay together. Um, and it does pretty good. Um, I think there's a coating on the, the material that I buy that actually allows the resin to, to grab onto it. But I'm gonna be honest, it's not the best bond. It's just not compared to other things. Um, even with burls, uh, you know, I'm gonna pass this around. And you've already seen the, the, the baby cap thing, right? But this is a piece of wood. And I already said, like, wood is pretty good and it's kind of spiky. Uh, but what I did with this burl is painted uh, some, some I, I think I actually used, like, maybe a UV resin or there's, there's either a resin on it or there's just paint. And all I did was coat it. Uh, it might have even been resin uh, mixed with some, some dye. Some sort of a, a, a painting when, uh, <laughs> occurred on this thing. Then I cast it and this is the result that I got. I got a bad adhesion problem. So how do you deal with that? Really, the best way to deal with it is just to scuff it up. Um, you know, you need the resin to be able to grab into something, so put something for it to grab onto. Um, grab some, you know, 120, 80 grit, scuff it up, and you might think, well, it's gonna look all scratched, but the, the resin typically is gonna kind of fill into those scratches and disappear, all right? So you can get away with some of these materials that are a little bit smoother and fix the problem beforehand, all right? So burls, um, like I said, you could maybe come in, if you really wanted to, you can maybe get like a, a, a steel brush and, and do, I'm not doing that, you know? <laughs> I, I just don't wanna do that. It, it, there's, it's, there's just too much, too much time wasted on something like that, but 
you need to understand that and, and identify where those problems may be because the, the burl, I, I'm gonna be honest, I actually just had a, uh, a, just a stabilized piece of wood that just had a very smooth kind of face to it. It just didn't really have the, the, any, any cracks. It didn't have any grain. And it was just kind of a smooth face. But I didn't paint it, I didn't, there was nothing on it. It was just stabilized. And I got that same, I'm not sure where that blank is, but I got that same kind of crackle effect on it. And I'm like, geez. So one thing that I do actually recommend, and, and I don't know, some people may disagree with this, but Alumalite Clear is a urethane resin. And I find that epoxies tend to stick to things better. So if it is a case, I would prefer, personally, I use the, the Alumalite Clear or Clear, it's, I use Clear Slow for 90% of the things that I do and it works just fine. But when I'm doing burls even that are smooth, I'm gonna pull out Liquid Diamonds or Amazing Clearcast Plus or even maybe Deep Pour. One of, those are the three epoxies that I typically use. Not saying they're the best, it's just the ones that I have and, and know. Uh, so they can help a little bit, but think about it. I mean, when some of you guys that have been casting for a while, you might notice that epoxies tend to not come out of molds as easy. And that's kind of the, the rationale that I'm using with this. They stick to things, they're harder to demold. So why not use those in scenarios where you may not have the best bond? So even with the honeycomb, that might help. It might just be the edge. Now, if you do cast something and you're still worried about the, the finished effect, the best advice that I can give you and the best friend to a resin caster, a, a pen turner, a wood turner is CA glue. Get the thinnest possible. And you guys are now carrying the star bond super thin, all the star bonds. I love the super fast thin from star bond. I just douse the heck out of things. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I've done a lot of crazy pens and things that should not work. I, I somehow managed to, to get through the straw length. If, if anybody's seen the mystery box, things that we were doing with Turner's Warehouse. Amy decided to throw in a bunch of straws. That is the hardest thing for, for resin to, to like grab onto. It's just totally smooth and it's, it's the same thing as those baby caps. And I'm going, this is gonna be a good you know, experiment and we're gonna see what happens. And somehow I actually managed to get through one of them. And it, part of it is because I doused the heck out of it with CA glue and I'm gluing things back in and doing all that stuff. So. I think you know, there are ways to kind of help the problem. And especially with the honeycomb, that's, that's something that I always recommend. When the blanks are done, I'll cut them up and then I'm just gonna actually, I actually douse the blanks with CA glue, let it dry for like a day. And then when I'm turning, I <laughs> give it another coat. And it's, what it's gonna do is just kind of, oh, there's the straws. Yeah, it was pretty fun. <laughs> Chad and I were laughing about this <laughs> when I opened it up. Um, it just, what it's gonna do is if there are any little cracks, it's gonna get in there and just kinda help seal things up. Um, you know, and, and just give you, it's like insurance. Super cheap insurance. So that's what I recommend in the worst case scenario. Now, for the pen turners, did you have a question? Yeah, if you use a metal um, inlay like I was using. Yeah, yeah. One, would you recommend dousing something like that with CA glue over, say, something like sanding, or would you do both? What do you recommend? Uh, so he, he embedded metal kind of fins, let's say. Do you have a, actually, yeah. Well, it's kind, of, it's kind of the same idea as like honeycomb. Um, I don't know, am I even on camera? Oh, what? For the folks at home. And if you're comfortable with it, you can pass it around. Um, yeah, I would douse that with honeycomb, why not? Um, but that would be like after, like while you're turning and stuff. I wouldn't, you don't, you don't need to douse it with honeycomb before you cast it. That's not going to do anything, right? Is that what you're, I'm, I just. Before you put the, the resin on it, would you put the CA that assists the No, resin? don't put CA glue with resin okay. before, like when you're casting. That, that's actually a kind of a, especially with alumilite, um, the alumilite clear, it reacts with it and it'll kind of foam and bubble. So. CA glue and resin is not a good idea. It's, it's once they're cured, you take them out. You, what you're doing is that bond between the two materials, you're just dousing. And, and if there are any little cracks or weak spots, it's gonna s slip in there. It'll, it'll like force its way. That super fast thin is so thin that capillary action will pull it into any tiny fractures. And then it'll cure and you're just kind of filling that gap and, and adding more glue in between the bond. All right, so 
do that after you've pulled it out or cut it up, then douse it. And then when you've you know, got it on the lathe, keep doing that. You take a little bit off, add a little bit of glue. I'm telling you that's the only reason I've gotten through half the stuff that I've gotten through because the other, I'm not a great turner. So <laughs> it's not the turning. It's, the, it's gotta be the CA glue, I think. Yeah, so I do prepare, one other thing that you can do, uh, well, one other issue that you can run into is, is actually contaminations on, on materials. So you noticed, and I kind of made a big stink out of it, I'm, I brought the stoner, this is mold release. What this does is you're gonna put it on your mold and it's gonna make the resin not stick to the mold as much or make it easier to demold. So basically this is like, like like a silicone spray of some sort, or think of something that it's, it's like a non-stick spray, you know, PAM or something like that, Somewhat, something similar to that, but different. I don't, I'm not gonna sit here and spray this on a mold when I got material that I might cast sitting right next to it, because if it lands on this, it's non-stick. It's even no, more non-sticker, <laughs> you know? So I, I usually try to spray this somewhere else, but let's say that I accidentally got you know, some of this mold release on these materials. What I'm gonna do with the honeycomb, and you can do this with other materials that can stand up to uh, acetone. Uh, some materials can't handle that. Uh, and, and in that case, I would go with, uh, 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 what is it, denatured alcohol. That's a little bit less, uh, I don't know, caustic or something. A little bit less aggressive. But what I do with this honeycomb is I'm gonna dunk it I'm gonna submerge it in a cup of acetone for like 10 to 15 minutes. And that, if there are any silicones, any WD-40s, any other weird oils or something like that that got on it, this stuff is manufactured and somebody put it together, boxed it up, might've been sweating, I don't know, had you know oil on their skin, handled it, and then it got shipped to me. So I have no clue out of the box what this stuff has on it. So I like to just dunk it. Um, and that usually gets, things pretty good. Um, I've, I haven't had too many issues uh, with this material. So how, what are we doing? How are we doing on time? Let's You're good. I got a question. If you hot glue something into a mold to hold it down, does the glue show up after you pour it and the blanks are set up? Yes. Yeah, it'll, it'll pop. Yeah. But for most part, you're going to cut that off. So the question was, you, everybody here heard, right? And everybody there. You should get a mic on your, yourself. Okay. You can ask questions. Um, yeah, if you hot, so you can, I don't have a mold. Let's just use this as an example. You can hot glue wood down. That's, that's the one other thing. That that's actually brings up a good point. Uh, even, <coughs> even stabilized wood can float. And, and Bob talked about this with it. He was doing the charcuterie boards. He uses like a silicone putty to, to lock stuff down in the mold. Um, but you could use like a hot glue, which doesn't make sense with HDPE, but it, it holds it long enough. HDPE, that, that's this white plastic, is non-stick. And you would think that, it, well, I would hot glue stick to it, but it does just enough to hold it in place. Um, and the question was, are you going to see that? And yeah, sure. You know, it's, it, it just kind of, the resin is going to kind of mold around it. So, but you just usually cut, it's on the outside of a turning blank. So you just cut it off. Um, so for, for the pen turners, how many people per, turn pens? Okay, so and, and cast pen blanks. So for pen turning, when you're dealing with mixed materials or difficult, especially difficult materials, um, oh, one thing I forgot was, can, can somebody grab the, one of the pinstripe 3D models that, that are on that table? Thanks, Haley. Um, so one of the things that I make are, are these resin 3D printed things that, that are plastic basically uh, and have pinstripes. And so they're round blanks. And one of the problems that you have is work holding with round blanks and drilling them. Um, and what, what can happen is if you just have a normal, like a pen, if you're doing it on a drill press and you have just a pen drilling vice, oh, perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm just gonna pass this around. So the pinstripe, that one's especially. It's got a lot of fins around it and, and you have a round blank and, and the normal pen drilling vise just has these two little bird's mouth things. And it's really hard to, to, to keep that blank from spinning while you're drilling it. it just, it's really hard to do that. So you, you crank it down even further and, you, and you're you know, 
holding this blank in there. Well, the problem is you're drilling that thing out, the, out of the center, and if you've cranked that thing down to the point where it's really exerting pressure, by the time you've drilled through that blank, it's just gonna crush it, or you're not even gonna know it crushed it, but it will have popped the bond between the resin and that material. Then you get it even after you've glued it and whatever, the first cut you make, it blows up in your face, and you're like, what happened? That's a terrible blank. It's because you crushed the blank, basically. So if you're doing round, if you're drilling round blanks, I really recommend grabbing a, a what are they called? A chuck, a collet chuck. Um, grab a collet chuck because it, 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 it exerts force evenly around the blank and it'll hold a round blank so that you can drill it and you're not having to crush the heck out of that thing. Because again, like I said, all these materials, if a bond's weak and you start putting a bunch of pressure on it, it pops that bond and that's why we get blowouts. Um, even drilling uh, blanks, you know, the number one rule for, I don't care if you're a woodworker or, or a wood turner or you're drilling things, sharp tools. And that includes drill bits. If you overheat your blank, it can, if it gets really, really hot, it can actually kind of crystallize the resin and it'll just crumble on you. Um, and in this case, you know, we're, we've, we've got like mixed materials in there with a weak bond. If you overheat that material, then the bond pops again. Uh, it just, it's not, it, it's, it's barely hanging on as it is and then you overheat it and between the, the forces of maybe expansion and contraction or just overheating that bond and it moving, it'll pop it. So again, CA glue is your friend still. <laughs> you can kind of keep it together. Uh, but you have to got, kind of think about these things, you know, weak bonds and all that kind of stuff are, are, are really tough with pen blanks because we have this little piece of material. We've drilled out the center and then we're jamming, we're, we're spinning it at 4,000 RPMs and then shoving a chisel in it. It's just, I got to be honest, the cards aren't even in our favor from the bat. And so some days I'm just like, I'm glad I got through this. Like it just, wow. Uh, now one other thing with turning uh, that I had. I had, well, higher speeds are going to be better for pen blanks. Um, obviously, within reason, you don't want to be going 4,000 with a bowl blank probably, but pen blanks, turn your lathe up as fast as possible, sharp tools always, and, and try not to overheat it. So, you know, the, the, the dull drill bit will overheat your blank. What I do is I only take like maybe a quarter inch depth and clear chips when I'm doing tough blanks like that very shallow passes with a sharp drill bit. Um, same thing goes though for, for sanding. And I actually ran into this problem recently. I cast some blanks on the live stream with honeycomb and it was like the worst batch of honeycomb blanks I have ever made. They were terrible. And I was like, wow, I need to just douse the heck out of these things. So, and I, I mean, I doused them with CA. What I realized was I flattened the brick. So I made a, a brick of, you know, a brick of blanks and I took it over to my, I have a, a belt sander and I just flattened it. Well, I didn't think about it, but I was like way overheating it. I was just holding it there and it was, it was a long sanding process and it overheated it. And I'm, I could actually physically, I could literally hear the, blank, the, the brick was popping after that. And I was like, oh, I overheated it. That's why. So overheating, watch even sanding uh, because it can screw with your bond. Um, and then the last thing is gluing tubes in. This is the biggest pitfall with pen blanks and especially with, even with just plastics or, you know, resins and stuff. Gluing your tubes in, the way that I do this, and a lot of people don't like this idea, but I, again, I think it's the reason that I've gotten through a lot of the things that I've gotten through. The way I do it, I'm gonna drill my blank out and then I'm gonna douse, when I'm, when I'm gluing the tube in, I'm gonna douse the inside of the blank with that thin CA first. Then I'm gonna take thick CA glue, which has a longer working time. The problem with CA glue is, you know, many of us, how many people have glued half a tube in, right? Okay, so don't do this with wood blanks. This is not, we're not talking about that. Um, and even if you, have, if you have a material in there that you just dried out, but it is not stabilized, be careful. Um, because you can, if it did grab a little bit of moisture out of the air, that's what kicks the CA glue off. So this is really for like plastic blanks, especially. Um, resin blanks, and I, I even do this with resin blanks that don't have materials or cracks or anything. Um, I douse the inside of the blank with, with thin C, that super thin CA, and I, well, first, first, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself. The first thing that I do is I'm gonna take the tube, 
and put the thick CA on it. And that's the stuff that is the longer working time not gonna set up on you immediately. So I get that and I have one of those sticks that holds the tube, douse the whole thing, stick it aside, and then I douse the inside of the blank and I, I'm wasting CA glue, but I'll tell you what, cheap insurance. Then I put my tube in and I think it's just the fact that I'm putting that CA inside. So if there's any cracks on the inside after I've drilled it, I'm sealing them up a little bit. And it's just a little bit of insurance. So I, I think that, I don't know. How are we doing on time now? Good. Yeah, how much time do we have left? <clears throat> Is there more time? Uh, Should we cast something? 15 to 30 minutes. Oh, we got time to cast something, okay. Okay. Zach, a couple comments from the- uh, Oh, it's sticky. The online, one gal says she loves that you're sharing these nuggets of gold knowledge Ooh. with everyone so you don't have to learn the hard way. Also, you're really cute. Um, and then everyone says uh, they enjoy the. My wife's still in there. There's going to be some fight. emoji fights. I, I didn't say that. Oh. Uh, they also like that you do show when stuff fails and things. Oh yeah. Because I fail on real. <laughs> a lot of things, and I, you know, that's actually one thing that I will just also share. Honestly, the biggest like breakthroughs that I've had with casting things is when things don't go right. Um, and it's, in some cases, I'm like, okay, don't do that again. Like that, it's just, that's all I learned was don't do that again. Most of the time though, it's not even that. It's, it's what I was going for didn't work. However, I learned, I'm like, oh, but that's how you do that, right? Like I, I didn't get what I was going for, but, but I got something amazing. And I was like, whoa. So, you know, don't be afraid to fail, fail often. And I mean, I think that every, I don't know, life lesson person always says that. Fail fast and fail often because that will get you on the right path, you know. Um, me showing you my, my successes is not really going to help that much. Uh, not as much as when I'm like, huh, that didn't work, you know, and you're like, I ain't doing that. That'll save you more money than me telling you how to do it usually. Um, and another thing is with resin casting, a lot of times you have something in your head. This is, the, this is the hardest thing with resin casting. These are just random life lessons with resin casting at this point. <laughs> it doesn't have to do with mixed materials, but a lot of times you have something that you're really going for, you're really hoping for the blank to turn out and look a certain way. That is really, really hard. That is the hardest thing to do is to get that thing out of your brain and make the resin do exactly what you wanted. So don't get frustrated if you're not getting perfect results. Um, don't be so hard on yourself because I, I do that all the time. I got stuff in my head and I'm, I'm like, that didn't work, but, but it's cool. Like I said, so that goes into the failures. It didn't work, but wow, that's interesting. I can, you know, tuck that into my notebook and, you know, if I wanted to do that, <laughs> I can come back to it. So let's cast, do we have any more resin? We're going to, okay. So to be totally honest, I did not even acetone these. So that kind of sucks, but I don't know. Someone will get these blanks. So what I was, what? Do you have a mold? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't even have a mold. Let me go grab you one. What's this for? Oh, excuse me. Oh, I forgot the second mold. The casting room is over there, so I don't know what room this is. You have a question? Quick question. Uh, I, I haven't turned any, like, flowers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is flowers. Um, how do you deal with those? And that's, there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can actually microwave those. Um, that is one that I have heard people get decent results with. Uh, I think the easiest way, uh, and I, I also think that, I, I'm gonna be honest, I am not an expert at this at all, um, and I really don't even have the patience for it, so I haven't done it much. I've, I've done it a couple times, but I actually think that the, the silica gel cover them in silica gel, and I think that it actually will retain your color. That's the biggest problem. If you put them in the oven, they're gonna turn brown. Like, you, you don't wanna heat them up, that's not gonna work. So, the microwave can work. I, th I have heard that, so you, you might try that, but I think your best bet is silica gel. Cover it totally with the silica gel, and then let it sit there, and once, some of the silica gel beadlets that you can buy will turn color when they've absorbed the maximum amount of moisture. So let's say, I don't know, but let's say it turns red, right? You can actually just microwave those, get the moisture out, and then redo it. So just keep doing that until you're, you've gotten the moisture out of the flowers, and then they should be pretty good. You should be able to, to cast them. I, uh, I'm on a website with liquid diamonds, mm -hmm. and I think people have been casting flowers using liquid diamonds. Yep. I know it's a different material. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you can use either, any of them. You can use epoxies or urethanes. Um, yeah, in, in that case, well, and one thing to, to kind of also note, a little side note, urethanes are the most sensitive to, to moisture by far out of all, there's three types of resin. There's polyester, there's epoxy, and there's urethane. Urethane is the most moisture sensitive, okay? So if you have a case where there's moisture possible, you might want to use an epoxy. I don't use just one resin. I use the best resin for the job. And there are certain brands that I just am familiar with and use for certain things. Uh, but you might want to use an epoxy in that case, just in case there was a little extra moisture that, that the, you know, you pulled it a little bit too soon. I think epoxy is going to be a little bit better at handling that than uh, urethane. So it might be a good idea. Did you get, did we get a mold? Uh, yeah, will one of those work? There's a Perfect. One too. I think, yeah, I think, I don't know, sure. you know, is that, you know, whatever. Because I, yeah, it'll work, this will work. I'm gonna just kinda, I'm gonna do a straight and I'm gonna do a sideways. So I, I sell the two different sizes and I was gonna uh, pass this around as just kind of a, a, you know, to see it, but I think everybody knows what this is. So I'm gonna kinda slide this one in and then just do, drop this one. Now, actually that brings me to one other, uh, one other tip for, for um, casting materials. There's, there's really two ways to cast them, okay? One way, you can put a bunch of material in the mold and pour resin on it. And that works fine as long as the resin can get everywhere in the mold. You're not trapping air, like a big pocket of air. The, the pressure pot can't fix the fact that there's no resin in this area, right? It, it collapses bubbles. So as long as, you know, like most of the time for like pine cones, that's, they're pretty open, they're open enough where you can just kind of shove them in there and just pour resin on it. Um, for something like this, I really don't want to pour resin on, you know, in on top of this. I personally don't like that. And there's a lot of other types of materials like this where it's like a tube. I'm gonna put this into the resin rather than the resin on it. Now, but the problem is it's double-edged sword because if you're doing like color swirls, it's gonna, mix, it's gonna kind of mix it up, all right? You're gonna move that around when you push it down. It's gonna agitate it, as Curtis would say. Um, but I think it's a better way. I'd rather have some color bleed than some air bubbles or pockets. Now, the other thing is though, if you've got a lot of material in there, and pour it on, I, I find this, sometimes it's kind of hard to get like, like a swirl or any kind of pattern. Like it just, it, cause it's like dribbling through like pine cones is a good example. It's kind of just dribbling through, which I think is awesome, but that may not be what you want. So you got to kind of assess the situation and you can push the pine cones down in, but it's going to agitate or you can put them in and pour it on and you're going to get drippy. So just a couple of notes. Zach, can uh, you take a question from online? Yeah, sure. If you're casting in a vertical tube, how do you control the swirl? That's how do you control it? Here's, here's some honeycomb. That's a stopper, a honeycomb dipper. So the, uh, how do I control the swirl? Yes. Okay, so that's, that's one thing I also, I'll, I'll kind of go over. You get different swirls pouring into a brick like this compared to pouring into a, a, like a PVC pipe or a tube. And what I do, I, really the, the swirl or the, the combination of color is two things. One of them is just the pouring. It's gonna kind of mix it up, but it's gonna be different than, you're gonna get a different look than pouring horizontally, I call it. Vertical pours are gonna be different, but you're gonna get a pretty good mix up by just mix pouring one color at a time. The other thing you can do is use a stick and just kind of swirl it around a little bit. And it'll mix it up, but again, it's not gonna be the same swirl as the brick mold. It's just gonna be a little bit different, but they both, I love them. I love vertical pours, they're fun. Okay, so we're gonna do 600. I'm gonna do, we're gonna do, one other product that I love is, is the blue to purple color shift powder that I sell. And we're gonna do some starlight glitter. And we're gonna make what I call blurple. Um, it's blue to purple. And we're gonna add a little bit of violet dye and it's just a mixture that I love for, for anything. Uh, where'd the violet go? That's not it. Here it is. All right. Blow up in my face. Blurple. Zach, what's your website? My website is resinworksstudio.com. I went for the most difficult, long thing I could think of. Works with an E. W-E-R-K-S. Because we ain't working. We're having fun. 
Oh, good Lord. They do that on purpose, though, yeah. so you get all these. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I think we, I think we're, I think I'm going, you know what the funny thing is, I want one drop. <laughs> <laughs> one drip. Okay. So. Is that you or these? Mm, I don't know. That's not going to work. Do you see if there's more of those cups in there, Amy? That one's liquid. You're good. <laughs> yeah. See if there's any more in there. <laughs> Tips for resin casting. Well, don't, don't use the cup that just has some liquid in it. Well, the problem... Use the cup that Amy, there's no more. <laughs> what? No, I don't the want to The problem do is everyone bought them, and then we didn't have any left to bring home. Yeah, well, so the, the, the good, good news problem, is but, you know. everybody bought the good cup. So at least, at least. Use that cup. Take those out. No, that's cool. We're, get, we're getting one, right? Is somebody getting one? Amy went to get some. Right. Uh, a couple other little notes. Typically, you know, if you are going to be mixing colors together, um, again, this isn't really mixed materials, but since we're all here and having a good time, um, one of the big tricks to, to keeping colors from bleeding is just wait until the end of the working time when it's starting to thicken up. It'll warm up. Uh, different resins are going to have like a different, I, I would recommend using a, a temperature gauge to actually read the temperature of your resin, 74. Um, but you're, you're waiting until the end, it's thickening up, which means that it's just not going to move as much. And the other thing about the end of the working time is it's going to turn solid soon. So it's not moving at all after that. So that's kind of one of the tricks. Um, there's techniques and all kinds of different stuff. You know, you're going to get different looks by doing it differently. But um, the end of the working time is kind of the key for that. I'm just going to do one color on this one. Um, if you want to see that, you know, like mixing colors and doing all kinds of stuff, I do live streams on my YouTube channel. Uh, uh, mm, I don't want to waste one of those huge ones. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. This is a giant one. <laughs> Why don't you get the big one? Yeah. I, I like that idea. That's sensible. Yeah. I think I painted. Okay. Uh, that, I did that one a long time ago. I'm not entirely certain. Uh, one way that you can, so th while we're passing that thing around, especially on stoppers like that that are see-through, personally, I don't care about threads and the, the, the nut. And the stuff. <laughs> Some people hate it. They're like, you're not an artist if you show that thing. And I'm like, who cares? It's really cool. I like it. If you hate it like that, though, one thing you can do is oversize drill a hole. So you're not even gluing anything in. Drill and over, so those inserts take a, a half inch drill bit. Drill something above half inch out. Pour black resin in there. Let it set up. Then drill your half inch and you don't even have to worry about anything. You know, whatever, just make sure that that difference is enough to, to cover up that, that thread. I, I like it. I'm like, it's the inner workings. It feels steampunkish or watch partsy inner I like the threads especially I really like that I think it's cool cutting your own threads and I think the average human is like how did you do that and I'm like by hand <laughs> <laughs> by hand with a machine yeah. all right so let's mix up some more resin and we're going to do blurple one thing that's kind of cool I don't usually do the the two inch honeycomb sideways so that's kind of fun but again you got to watch out I don't want to just stick this in there I want and I'm going to kind of I want to make sure that the resin flows around this. And so this one I could maybe put in there and just let it kind of flow sideways. That might work pretty well. Or I only have one color, so I don't really care. I'm not going to mix, mess anything up. So maybe I'll put it in kind of sideways, but make sure that the air is being forced up and out. All right, so we got part A. Uh, do we have part A regular? Yeah. Is there another A? Didn't we get an A? No, I don't know what's going on. That's B. Whoever was in that casting room. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that guy. What? What? Who? Who? 
Well, I guess we're not going to probably see this. So we're going to use, we're just going to use the slow. It doesn't really matter. Either way, it's good. So we're going to go 300 grams of part A. I like using the thing. Three hundred. The online is requesting to see who's here. <laughs> <laughs> wave, everybody, wave. Ready? <laughs> and back. <laughs> Should we wave the wave? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, so we're doing okay. We got three hundred grams of part A. Lost the cap. Nope. No. We're good. We got we got tons of B. Well, some B. Zero the scale out. And so you read the zero the scale as opposed to just going to six hundred grams. Yeah, you know again it's I mean it eh. Whatever, okay, but it's it's one of those things. Like I said at the beginning, I really try to do as many things that will minimize. If something goes wrong, that I'm like, well, was it the scale thing that I didn't do? So I try to be pretty consistent with all those types of things, uh, just so that it's just so much easier to diagnose a problem when you're not like, well, I kind of did it sort of good on the scale, and then I was sort of not I mixed it a little bit, I guess. I don't know. If you're like, I did everything that I could right, what went wrong? It's just a little bit easier, I think. Plus, you know, a lot of the blanks that I make, I sell. And so, you know, maybe if I was just doing it myself in my own little world, maybe it wouldn't matter so much if I was making a blank or two, but I don't want to sell products that I don't know how good they are, you know. I want to make sure that the consistency is there for the products too. So I just do that with everything. But it saves you money even. It, it, it's not just a product you know, marketing thing. It's, if you do that, you're not wasting re as much resin because you probably don't have as many mistakes, I guess. That's, that's my mentality with it. OK, we're close enough. I just said, uh, you got to be really careful about this. And I'm like, that's good enough. <laughs> We have different philosophies. <laughs> it's true. I learn a lot from Chad. I'm like, how would you do this, Chad? And he's like, it'll take me two seconds. And I'm like, God, it takes me three hours to do that my way. He's like, you don't need to do that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, close enough. That's funny because it's super true. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know. But you're, you're more like, it's within reason, though. Oh, yeah. You're not like, well, I don't know if that's going to work. No. You're just not like super anal about like every minor detail that nobody cares about. Like you, you have a very good awareness of nobody cares about that. <laughs> While some of us are like, but it has to be. Yeah. I have weird things like that. And then, but then sometimes I just hit a wall and I'm like, I don't care. I'm done. I, I can't th think about this anymore. It's a weird, I don't know what, the, I don't know what that's, a, that's a totally other problem, I think. I don't have, I have like a half OCD thing. So that, what is the appropriate mix time for A and B that you're doing? Mix time? Um, I don't really go by time. I've heard three minutes. Nah, uh, yes, sure, five could be good. But the problem is, well, no, the problem is if, if you're mixing this slow, is three minutes long enough? No. You know, so that's not a good basis. Um, what I do recommend is when you're mixing your resin up, I really recommend, and I still do this today, and I don't really need to probably, but again, I'm a little anal about things. Mix your resin clear so that you can see, and, and you're, when you're looking in there, you can see wispy trails of haziness. If you can see those, you ain't done. So I don't care if it's three, ten minutes. I don't know. You might be kind of screwed if it was ten minutes now, but... <laughs> You know, it's, it's more about mixing properly than, than time. Um, and so again, you know, mixing, a lot of people just kind of, I jam the stick to the bottom of the cup, so it's always scraping the bottom and getting is, all that stuff off. And then I'll stop every once in a while 
get the sides, you know. If all you did was just mix the stick in the middle, you're gonna have problems because there's, there's a bunch of part A or B or something on the, on the edges. So it's more about that where I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it and I, don't, I do it subconsciously, I guess. I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, looking and making sure that everything looks good. And then once I'm, there's no swirls or weird haziness, it's totally clear looking. Then I just a little, I'm like, okay, just a little bit more and then I'm good. I typically will go a little bit longer with epoxies. I find that their alumilite clear and clear slow mixes together extremely well. It's a, it's a low viscosity resin. Typically when it's fully clear and all you're seeing are a few bubbles, like you're good. It's pretty, you should be fine. There's not, there's not any issues. Epoxies can be a little fussy sometimes. So I usually give it a little bit of maybe another minute after I think it's good. Uh, but for the most part, Time is, it's a tough one. And I think time might work a little better if you're paddle mixing a bucket of resin. Okay, yeah, five minutes of paddle mixing, that's probably good, you know, for three gallons of resin, I don't know. Bob would probably, he might do that, I don't know. I think he uses a drill of some sort. Well, that, yeah, that's what I mean, like a drill paddle mixer thing. Um, what am I doing? Blurple. 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 And purple. So this is blue to color, blue to purple color shift powder. And this, is, this stuff's available on my website. I love this stuff. I love the color of it. So I thought, let's use that today. And then we'll also add my favorite starlight glitter. And I'm gonna just put a ton of this stuff in here. We're gonna make it super awesome. Two scoops, that should be pretty good. Uh, when you're doing pen blanks, the biggest problem we have is the tube, uh, if you're doing kit pens anyway. Um, you want to add enough mica powder or color or whatever to make sure that you're not seeing the tube or at least make it really close so that all you got to do is paint the tube, not the inside of the blank. Um, because it just looks horrible. Uh, that's one thing. I don't mind the stupid nut thing in a, in a stopper, but I cannot stand seeing a tube in my pen. Um, I don't know why. It just typically doesn't look good. Um, so, uh, you know, add enough. Now, this stuff is never going to get opaque, and that's one of the reasons why I add a little bit of and it doesn't take much, just like a drop of violet with this. But I, I wanna show you guys how cool this looks. I'm gonna try and get around. We, good thing we use the, the clear slow. Oh, I mean, it's just, there's some clumps that I haven't mixed up yet, but it's just kind of a wicked, so this is without any dye, and it's gonna be see-through and kind of weird. Like if, if that's all we did, it would be totally transparent and, but you can kind of see shades of blue and purple in there, especially when I kind of mix it up. It really pops out when you have sh uh, curves on something. Like this is actually the same, it, they use this as automotive paint is, is actually one of the uses of this stuff. And so when you see a car that looks blue over there and it's purple over there, that's What's this it stuff. Oh, what? What's this called? Um, it's just blue to purple color shift powder. It's available on my website. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and if um, you guys go back to check out the live stream to watch it again. We'll put all the links to Zach's stuff that he's mentioning so, I just, I just, so it's easier for I us. just kind of dripped a little bit of the, the purple dye. It's violet dye. Now look at it. And I just love that color. But it, you still have, you know, so I, and the, the Alumilite violet dye is pretty dark, like really dark dye but you still have shade, it's less, there's a little bit less, but you still have shades of blue and purple going on in there. I'm gonna knock over all the cameras probably. Hold, hold on real quick, all right? He's on a time crunch now. Yeah, he is now. <laughs> We're on a time crunch. We're using the five gallon pot just so you know. Yeah, okay. And then I'm gonna drop in some starlight glitter, this stuff rocks. Yeah. Not at all. No. Totally different. Um, the nebula, it's, it's a red, blue, and, and purple mix. So I do a question, question online. When you paint your tubes, what do you paint them with? What kind of paint? Powder coat from Turner's Warehouse. <laughs> I hate painting tubes because uh, I'm usually doing stuff and it's the next day and I don't have time to be messing around with all that stuff. So I, I usually use the powder coated tubes from Turner's Warehouse. 
Unfortunately, you can only get certain kits, but you, you guys notice that I use Sierras, Cigars, and Juniors a lot. Those all come in powder-coated uh, tubes, and that's one of the big reasons. The other reason is you've got a lot of choices within the line. So I only need a 2764 drill bit for a ton of different types of Sierras. I only need a 10 millimeter for cigar or everything, and there's lots of plating. So I, I just kind of look at that that way. My thing is I don't sell pens, really. I'm, I'm not a pen maker and seller and all that stuff. I make blanks. I'm looking to see what this thing looks like, as this blank looks like as a pen. I don't care what kit it is so much in, in most cases. So I'm just kind of turning it. I'm like, oh, here's a cool cigar. The blank looks amazing. So it's, that's, that's my personal focus usually. So uh, with a, one thing, you know, I was talking about the, the mixing colors together. I'm just going to start dumping this. Uh, in there. Zach, Rick Timmerman says it was so awesome to meet you today. Awesome. He's probably already three hours away. Oh. Uh, he was here this morning. That's cool. It was good meeting you too. <coughs> I'm just going to kind of push that down in there. And I'm watching. There's little air bubbles here and there. I'm just going to kind of let them pop out. And you can kind of move the, you know, especially again, in this case, I don't really care if I disturb the resin in this. You can kind of move it around and Lift it, just to try and get those air pockets. It's more of a pocket than a bubble in this case, out. What do you got? No, no, I was just clearing the view. Oh. You were just blocking the camera. Oh. You're good, you're good. <laughs> what? <laughs> With the cup? Yeah, it's um. coming at you sideways there. Oh, really? Oh. You're good. Okay. Don't press it. Don't mess up. Uh, so what I was gonna, what was I saying? See, I, I get totally, when people do something, move a cup or do some, ask a question, I'm like, what? What was I talking about? This is why I used to, Gretchen would be on a headset when I was doing live streams, and then she'd be talking in my ear, and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> I'm trying to make a point, and then I'd lose it, and I'm like, whatever. You guys lost good nu golden nuggets. Poof. So I don't do that. Well, I, she can't do that anymore. But. That camera? This cup was in the way of that camera? Settle down, wow. Higgins. <laughs> no, I just, I, I wanted to know. Just to, like, I just, I wanted to know. It, yeah, this one. It didn't, I'm like, wait, which one are we doing? Here? All right, so everything looks pretty good in there. And we got one that's kind of up and down, one sideways. And then uh, one thing I also wanted to mention about the aluminum honeycomb is people ask, how do you cut it? And I want to, there's some good information. So once. I got to stop talking because I told you I can only think of one thing at a time. Now, is that going to float up or is it heavy enough to go straight down? It's, it's not going to float. Um, it's not buoyant. In this case, you know, the metal is not buoyant. There's nothing, there's no air or anything kind of making it float. So you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Okay. While Zach's doing that, um, everybody here, if you could do me a favor when you get home, if you have a YouTube account, go on and subscribe to Turner's TV. Make comments for these guys. Like uh, most of these guys came here on their own dime, so pretty cool. Uh, but also we're trying to get Turner's TV built up so we can do more live streams and stuff and it really helps. So. Uh, if you're online, subscribe, and if you guys are here, please go subscribe just to help us out with that. And then you can give these guys shout outs and kudos and things. No, YouTube, but our channel is Turner's TV, Turner's Warehouse. You'll see our logo and everything. Okay. Yeah. Same one. Were you told that? Well, so I have a channel, my name, but then Turner's TV is a channel, yeah. Okay, so cutting this stuff, I just use a bandsaw. I, I bought a metal cutting blade. That's not even, don't do it. It doesn't change anything. I just use a normal wood blade. Um, higher tooth count is going to be better, um, but you will get a little, you know, the edges of this is how it comes out when I cut it. So, but a bandsaw is great. Now, the thing that you have to, this is important, folks. If you're going to cut this stuff, do not try to resaw it. <laughs> cut it flat on the table with the honeycombs moving, you know, like the two inch. You can't buy two inch and cut this into a bunch of quarter inch, all right? You can cut this out this way, 
Do not stick this through your, your I tried it. Those shorts are no more. <laughs> so the thing is, this honeycomb is super, um, you can't crush this this way. Um, they use it for like aircraft panels and decking and walls and all kinds of stuff where people are standing on it this way. And especially if you clad it with something else on the outside, it is super strong this way. This way, it just squishes. And so when the band, the minute the first tooth grabs onto this stuff, it just crumples. <laughs> I was like, ah! <laughs> That's what happened and it was pretty scary. So do not do it that way. Just, you know, we got two sizes, seven eighths, two inch. That's all you get. So, but it, but it cuts easy. It's very easy to cut with a bandsaw. Do you want to pull it? Oh yeah. Too, too soon? I don't know. It's, this stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, we're at the end. That was, was a while ago. Yeah. <clears throat> so Zach did bring some of this stuff. If you guys are interested, see him after the. Smell it. Yeah. We can smell the vegetables. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Weird. Yeah. Oh, it's gonna be gross. Yeah. It's gonna be oh, disgusting. we're losing the. Uh -oh. We're good. Might wanna. Might wanna give it. Mmm. It is nice. It does smell like a vegetable. Like a disgusting vegetable. <laughs> Mmm, salad. Everybody's gonna go clean up the tray now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mmm. This camera we on. We might want to do the overhead. Okay, hold it up to this one when you pull it out. Mmm. Oh wow, it didn't. Disgusting. <laughs> kind of liquidy. Gross. It smells foul. Is it even, can you see it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It doesn't smell that bad. So you're it's... recommending not doing it. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I think it would be best to just yeah, everyone can come up after. put this up here and you guys can all come up and look. There's actually liquid, so those things are wet. Okay, that's probably, that's, nobody's gonna do that probably, but I wanted to illustrate what happens and so two problems. <laughs> no, there's water in it. Two problems happen. You know, you, you have this white haze. And the problem with this is if you're going for transparent, whatever, and, and you, even if, if you had just a layer of moisture on a piece of wood and then you had clear, you're probably going to get a white haze, you know, even if there's just a little bit of moisture on that, especially with urethane. The other thing is in the worst case, in which you just shove water in this stuff, with urethanes, it's going to foam. And, and so... <laughs> I'll let you cut this up and turn it. Uh, I'm gonna throw that mold away. Why? Acetone, will, or, <laughs> you know, it'll clean it up. Yep. Put a little tussin on it. Yeah. So anyway, any, any other questions? Anything I missed? Yeah, yeah. You were talking about gluing in the pen blanks. Yep. What about the uh, Gorilla Glue that's activated by water? You can use that, but I'd still hit it with CA on the inside. So a lot of people use epoxy, right? I don't know, I don't know, I don't use Gorilla Glue personally, but if you wanted to, you could try that. But I still think that th the whole point is the, the thin CA on the inside to seep in. Gorilla Glue is not gonna do that. It's just gonna foam up. It's not gonna fix any cracks or anything between a material, right? So I really don't care what the out, like the thick CA on the tube, I don't think it plays any part. It's just, it doesn't set up right away and it's quick for me, so, and I've had good results. I think you could use epoxy, five minute epoxy. You could probably use Gorilla Glue. I don't know though for sure on that. I definitely, I use epoxy for wood. If I'm doing wood blanks, I'm, I'm gonna use like a five minute epoxy for sure. All right. Any other questions? So questions? real quick before we wrap up. Um, what? Any other questions? Any other questions? Nope. All right. Cool. So if you wanna see Zach after, come take a look at that. Uh, if you need to get a selfie Still with bubbling. him, show these guys some love online. Uh, Curtis, Elise, Jim, Zach. Bob's not here anymore, uh, but thanks for coming out. The store will be open for a little bit, and Zach has his stuff. Don't forget to hit his website up, ResinWorks. ResinWorks Studio. <laughs> yeah. .com. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I got some. Uh, I probably just keep it up here. All right, thanks, well, thank Zach. You guys. Woo! Thank you. Are we still live? We're still live. You want to send a message to your wife? Is she still here? She was a minute ago. She should work. Jeez. Oh, oh, oh. Jeez. Thank you everybody for coming out.
Thank you all. Thank you for having us. It's great seeing everyone. Mm. Yeah, come take a look at this. The most disgusting blank I've ever seen. Zach, it's like no big deal. So you've made some gross stuff. No, no, you guys can leave it all. We'll take it. I really appreciate it. What are those other blanks? Uh, they're up here. I was just curious what they look like. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Thank you guys. Yeah. When you put the thing in the fire, you have to cut that.